morning, David. Good morning. Good morning. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who always makes us aware of the blessings that surround us. And biggest gift that he has sent in our way is our salvation uh, through our faith in him. His death and resurrection makes all the difference uh, as we live each day. Today is the 12th uh, Sunday after uh, Easter. Uh, Having celebrated all those special Sundays, we are more into the common grounds now, and each Sunday allows us to celebrate and recognize um, any special ministries within our boundaries. As we gather here, our announcements are already listed on your uh, bulletin. Uh, August 4th is the United Methodist Women's Group meeting at 9 a.m. Karen Lennon is the hostess, and Jackie Mays is the leader. And then August 6th, uh, Youth Car Wash. Uh, Jackie, we have any other information on that?
Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other announcement? Tina? Okay, thank you for that information. Uh, any other announcements? Okay, if not, then our volunteers are listed here for the next Sunday. And we have some birthdays to recognize. July 25th, Brett Mason is celebrating the birthday. And on 27th, Tina celebrates her birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to Tina. And we surround you with God's blessings for your life. Okay, any other recognitions that we need to do? If not, then let's begin our worship service as we come together in the name of the Lord. If you're able to stand, we will read our call to worship responsibly. Our mouths shall speak the praise of the Lord for the mighty things he has done in our lives. Let all people bless his holy name. It is appropriate to raise our voice and sing. We raise the cup of thanksgiving in the presence of God and those around us to let them see that our God has been gracious to us. This is a time of witness to those who have yet not felt God's power working in their lives. Each of us are called to present Christ in our words and actions. We are not perfect. God always knows that. God empowers us when we struggle in the path of faith because he wants to succeed as witnesses of his love in this world. Okay, our opening hymn number is 103.
our prayer of confession for us to read together, please. The seed of God's word is being sown in our hearts in many different ways. We encounter God's love in each phase of our lives. We are led by his spirit on the path of righteousness. What else can we ask from him? He has given us <coughs> our words of reflection, uh, words of assurance for our reflection. Gracious Lord, you pour out your spirit upon us for this wonderful gift we praise you. Your spirit assures us that we are your children. By your spirit we have life and have it abundantly. Make us the good soil in which your word takes root and brings fruit. Amen. You may be seated, please. And our hymn of preparation is number 452. And at this time, we have a sharing of our talents. Well, the drunks are kind of on county fair hangover this morning, so <laughs> I had come across this uh, uh, entitled Rooneyisms some time ago, and I don't know if these were. Uh, things directly uh, attributed to Andy Rooney or just uh, things he might have repeated or orated, but uh, I thought they were worth sharing. I've learned that the best classroom in the world is at the feet of an elderly person. I've learned that when you're in love, it shows. I've learned that just one person saying to me, you've made my day, makes my day. 
I've learned that having a child fall asleep in your arms is one of the most peaceful feelings in the world. I've learned that being kind is more important than being right. I've learned that you should never say no to a gift from a child. I've learned that I can always pray for someone when I don't have the strength to help him in some other way. I've learned that no matter how serious your life requires you to be, everyone needs a friend to act goofy with. I've learned that sometimes all a person needs is a hand to hold and a heart to understand. I've learned that simple walks with my father around the block on summer nights when I was a child did wonders for me as an adult. I've learned that life is kind of like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it goes. I've learned that we should be glad God doesn't give us everything we ask for. I've learned that money doesn't buy class. I've learned that those small daily happenings that make life so sp spectacular, I'm sorry, I've learned that it's those small daily happenings that make life so, so spectacular. I've learned that under everyone's hard shell is someone who wants to be appreciated and loved. I've learned that to ignore the facts does not change the facts. I've learned that when you plan to get even with someone, you are only letting that person continue to hurt you. I've learned that love, not time, heals all wounds. I've learned that the easiest way for me to grow as a person is to surround myself with people smarter than I am. I've learned that everyone you meet deserves to be greeted with a smile. I've learned that no one is perfect until you fall in love with them. I've learned that life is tough, but I'm tougher. I've learned that opportunities are never lost. Someone will take the ones you miss. I've learned that when you harbor bitterness, happiness will dock elsewhere. I've learned that I wish I could have told my mom that I love her one more time before she passed away. I've learned that one should keep his words both soft and tender because tomorrow he may have to eat them. I've learned that a smile is an inexpensive way to improve your looks. I've learned that when your newly born grandchild holds your little finger in his little fist that you're hooked for life. I've learned that everyone wants to live on top of the mountain, but all the happiness and growth occurs while you're climbing it. And finally, I've learned that the less time I have to work with, the more things I get done. Thank you, Tony. I apologize for my voice today. I thought yesterday's rain will help my allergies down. But once the corn begins tasseling, um, I'm not myself. So please bear with me today, OK? We are coming together for our time of uh, prayer. And um, what a good way to start thoughtfully what Tony has offered us this morning. Uh, each moment in your life counts. Each experience in your life counts. And uh, God has willed that for us, that from those moments we learn what it is. So as we come for the time of prayer, I know we have all kinds of um, thoughts at this time. Um, anything special that you would like to raise unto the Lord? Okay, if not, then let's bow our heads and come together in the presence of the Lord. When God created human beings, he was mindful the story that will unfold through Adam and Eve. But he still went ahead and chose the souls to be ordained as humans. And since then, and for eternity, generations will be born because God is the one who chooses each soul to be sent into this world. The reason is that he believes and trusts in that soul. He believes that this human being is my precious child. And as you come together this morning to worship the Lord, to bring about your words of thankfulness, bring about your prayers of concerns, be assured that God already knows you. Dear God of heaven and earth, our creator and our counselor, 
you who sustain our lives, you who uphold us in each and every moment as we take our breath, we know that we are special. We have been created amazingly. And as we come together of one faith, one baptism, one savior, may our fellowship be blessed because it is all due to your son, Jesus Christ, who became a human being to bear the burden of sins of the whole humanity and to offer it unto you. Yes, he felt lonely. That's why he cried out, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? And in our lives, there are times and moments when we feel that way. We cry unto you, and then there is the resurrection that waits, the sound of victory. And so, Lord, we offer you praise and thanksgiving for giving us a living Savior. As we live our faith each day, there are challenges in our way. And we ask that you will give us wisdom and strength to make the right decisions, the power of discernment that we all need. At this time, we pray for each other. Uphold us in our strengths, in our gifts and graces. And as we live our faith each day, may our outreach of ministry be able to provide a witness to all those who still are not aware of your love. Continue to surround us with your miracles of healing and strength. We send out our prayers of healing for those who are still <coughs> need that special touch from you. And a prayer of comfort and peace for those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. Loving and gracious Lord, you have power, you have strength. You are our creator, and that is why our help comes from you. We raise our prayers unto you. We also pray for our uh, nation, for our denomination, for our communities where we live, so that the story of the living Lord be told and retold in so many different ways that we are able to establish a living witness of faith for many. Bless us, bless our families, be with our children, guide them, protect them, uphold them in your grace, O oh Lord. Hear our prayer, because we ask this prayer in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. <coughs> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time we have children's message. If the kids would like to come forward for the time of fellowship, please.
Don't forget him. <coughs> Let's continue our worship service, and now we bring our uh, tithes and offerings to the Lord, and we need help from our ushers, please. God of all blessings, we give back but a portion of the gifts that we have received from you. This is our way of remembering your graciousness to us. In this gesture, we believe that others will come to know you also. Amen. Please be seated. Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now, as they went their way, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful, 
Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. Most of us have experience in entertaining guests at home and being hospitable. Um, most of the responsibility, I think, falls on women's uh, shoulders uh, whenever guests are coming. And I think uh, as women, we, you tend to go overboard with cleaning and dusting and arranging things and cooking and rearranging everything again. And how many times uh, in our aspect of hospitality, uh, we get so worn out that by the time guests come, we are not even emotionally, physically prepared to be with them. Because even all that time, we are thinking as women, now what's next? What needs to be in place? What needs to be cooked? What needs to be brought in? What is here? What is there? Lots of anxiety. In the Gospel of Luke, he does not mention anything about the town. He doesn't mention that uh, they are the sisters of Lazarus. But he gives us a motive of servanthood. And as I mentioned last week that the story was all about men, today the story is about women. But again, I want to make it gender neutral when it comes to the motives of ministry. Because God doesn't call us separately that this is the ministry that men are supposed to do and this is the ministry that women are supposed to do. As I mentioned last week, it's gender neutral ministry when it comes to the ministry of faith and ministry of the church. So in today's story, which happens and it takes place in a home, which means that the first step where the ministry of Christ or ministry of faith begins is my home, your home, the place where you live. How is that place defined for your guests, for your neighbors, for your communities? How is it the relational aspect is spread out from the place that you live? And I think Luke makes it very clear that this is the house where there is a lot of pressure on welcoming people and inviting them and you know going all the way, whatever it takes to be hospitable. And he mentions only the two main characters in this story, uh, Martha and Mary, about two sisters. They are the ones who are uh, more or less involved in offering this ministry, this hospitality. How they do it, we already know what Martha did. She took over all the responsibility on her. And um, there were, like I have, might have mentioned before, there were no microwave ovens or other ovens that you could pop in a TV dinner for Jesus and, you know, here it is or make a cup of coffee in microwave oven. It used to take sometimes all day long. They had to choose the animal, kill it, process it, and then begin the cooking process. And then if you are cooking for just one person, that would be reasonable to cook inside. But here was Jesus coming with his whole team. And not only that, there were other people who would come in. And of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were just spectators and they made themselves at home. Wherever Jesus went, they went. Hey, free food, you know? And Martha had to prepare all that food. And she took caution. She took every um, effort to make it the best meal 
that Jesus ever had. Nothing wrong with that. Hospitality is hospitality. You make your guests feel welcome. But the aspect of it was that she had taken over all the responsibility on her. I think she was like me. If I don't do it, it will not be done. And also, it will not be done the right way. We have that personality, right? We don't want to leave anything to anybody. No, I will do it, do it my way. And so what happens, there is the burnout situation. The ministry of the church is sometimes fits into this motive of Martha ministry. First thing is, in this ministry, that we make a choice. Human nature is that we choose. Right from the start, a child begins to choose he or she, hungry or comfortable or wants to go out or sleep or not sleep, so on and so forth. And as they continue to grow, they have the freedom of choice to go to school, to stay at home, make friends, play outside, play inside, whatever they want to do. Choices are what make us who we are. And sometimes we make the choices just for ourselves, to obey or disobey, to listen or not to listen, to give aspect of ministry or help to others or not. And that brings forth the formation of personality. And as this child grows up, becomes youth, they begin to make choices about their own habits and gifts and their, uh, their involvement in the school or community or committees and teams, uh, social, unsocial. And as they grow up to be adults, that makes their personality more solid. When it comes to the church ministry, we do have Martha syndrome. Many of us have Martha syndrome because we think that church is the one that needs to do everything, all kinds of projects. And believe me, I have seen these 30 plus years of my ministry in this conference, I have seen the bandwagons that are conference has chosen every three years or four years. Everybody was out for that ride. Now where are those bandwagons? I don't see them. Where are those ministries? I don't see them. Each four years we drop them and we pick up something else. We drop them, we pick up something else. We call it progress. But what about the ministries that we began 30 years ago? Do we ever go back and look towards them? That's where I'm having problems. Choices are to be made for the ministry of the church, for the ministry of the gospel. But those choices need to be what you can practically do that. Many churches, they want to do the youth program. When the new pastor comes, uh, they want a youth program. They don't have any youth in the church but they want the pastor to be the miracle worker. Bring the kids in the church. Well, where are your kids? Those are the units that I have to start. Are we are talking about the home ministry, right? So let's begin with home. If your kids are not in the church, then how is the pastor going to bring other kids in the church? They also think that pastor needs to just bring about a revolution, a, a just spiritual transformation in the church in one month or three months. We are not uh, seeing anything happening, Pastor. People are not being fed by you, okay? You have been in this church for 50 years. What have you done? Is your well dried out? Do you know who is the wellspring of faith? Then there are some people who think that the pastor should be involved in all the community activities. 
blood mobiles and school activities and nursing homes and this thing and that thing. Oh, you are not there, you are not there, you are not there. Where are you as church members? It's your ministry as much as it is for that one person, pastor, that you call to do all these 50 jobs. Ministry begins at home by making choices. And if we as the church members are not involved in the ministry, we know that the church life is over. But at the same time, the Martha syndrome also kills the witness of the church. Sometimes we as the church take over too much responsibility. Like they say, you have too many irons in the fire. And some of us like that, too many irons in the fire just to show the people, oh, I'm so busy. I'm doing this for the church. I'm doing this for the church. I'm doing this for the church. Where is the pastor? Oh, pastor doesn't have that gift. But pastor doesn't do anything. But I'm doing it. And that Martha syndrome, that kind of witness in front of people creates anxiety, tension, and also shows the turmoil that is going on, the tug of war about responsibilities that is going on in the church. And people stay away from especially the house of the Lord. When Christ sent his disciples out for ministry, I think I spoke about that a few weeks ago, he sent them two by two and he said, travel light. Don't carry any burden on you of clothing or food or whatever. You are going to be dependent on the hospitality where you go. Stay there, preach the gospel, tell them the story, tell what God is doing for you. And if they are accepting of you, the blessings will stay there. Martha syndrome sometimes takes over my life also. I want to do everything by myself and I want to do too many things by myself. And in the end, as desperate as Martha was, I also cry out, don't you see God? I am doing so much for this church. I'm doing so much for this community and there is no one helping me out. There, those are the people sitting very quietly at your feet. And what does Christ say? There's need of only one thing. And Mary has chosen that. Again, choice is made. When it comes to the ministry of the church, the main focus is on being at the feet of the Lord, sitting close by. And remember that back then the cultural aspect of the ministry was that no women were allowed. When the men would gather, it was the room full of men. And here is Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Luke doesn't mention what else she did. Matthew goes into detail, but Luke doesn't. Luke's main focus is on the choice that Mary makes. She chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus. Make him feel at home. Make him feel as the guest. Make him feel that this is where he belongs. This is where he is needed. Sitting at his feet and listening to every word that he says. And Martha misses out. Sometimes there is a conflicting group in our churches also, Martha group and Mary group. One is more on the physical aspect of the church, the other one is more on the spiritual aspect of the church. The spirituality aspect allows us to be more devotional, more into prayer life, more into scriptural studies, and out of that emerges the motive of ministry. Now that I have received the blessing, now that I have received the spiritual strength, what is my calling? And Christ sends us out two by two. Go and make disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them. 
and teach them everything that I have taught you. Friend, this is the time, month, as many churches have received the new pastors within our denomination, and they are re-evaluating their aspect of ministry under the leadership of the new pastors. At the same time, we are, who are the leaders in this church, we know that we are entering into the preparation for the charge conference. Another challenge is in front of us, to prepare ourselves to evaluate, to set goals, to have a vision of ministry, what lies ahead. Under the circumstances through which we have traveled for the last few years, the ministry has been different. And believe me, it is going to be different, entirely different. But we who are part of the body of Christ right here in this church, we are called to make choices. Is Martha syndrome going to kill us? Or are we more inclined towards the Mary syndrome? Realizing, knowing who is the source of power, who gives us strength, who gives us healing, who gives us assurance of forgiveness of sins, who heals us. Are we in tune with that person? Are we in relation to Jesus Christ? Because out of that relationship emerges your motive of ministry. All those who are in leadership place, we are already evaluating the ministry of our church, how different it's going to be, how broad it's going to be, how small it's going to be. But when you know your place at the feet of Jesus, that's where you sit and you counsel, then Jesus says there is only need for one thing. And such and such person has already chosen that. I hope that as you get involved in the preparation for the charge conference, as you who are lay servants, as you do your evaluation, as you project your goals and visions for your ministry, and you get involved in the ministry of this church and, of course, community-wide. Remember that each of us are called to sit first at the feet of Jesus. That's the beginning point of your hospitality. That's where it all begins. There is need for only one thing, and Mary has chosen that. I hope and pray that each of us make that choice. Let's conclude our worship service by singing our concluding hymn number 504. We have changed this hymn, Lord, you gave the great commission, though it is appropriate with the topic, but hymn number 504. And let's sing first and the last verse of this hymn, please. On a hill far away.
God the Father has set us free, so may we may dwell in peace and harmony with others. The message of the resurrection of Christ assures us of the power given to us to be his disciples. The presence of the Holy Spirit residing in us is the visible witness of God's love. Let us go in peace. Amen. Thank you.